So first of all, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this inaugural launch of a new seminar series uh, called The Exchange, a Critical Conversations with Michigan Public Health. And I want to start by extending a warm welcome uh, to our keynote speaker, Dr. Isabel Angelowski. Uh, there she is. Thank you so much for, for, for being here. Uh, I'd also like to welcome our expert panelists, Mayor Abdullah Hamoud, Alexa Bush, and Professor Mark Zimmerman. This series is something that uh, we conceptualized actually prior to the pandemic, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to see it finally come to fruition, and uh, glad that you're here for this inaugural launch. The primary goal is really to create a space where academics, uh, scholars, and students from Michigan Public Health and other institutions can convene to discuss critical public health issues, to exchange ideas, and then ultimately to influence and accelerate a course of action to create uh, a healthier and more equitable world for all. The theme of today's event, the future of healthy cities. And for those of you who are familiar with some of the school's programming, uh, will note that, in, in fact, by design, this theme is very relevant to a core topic in our new uh, interdisciplinary research initiative, Public Health Ideas. IDEA stands for Interdisciplinary Discovery, Engagement, and Actions for Society. And across our school, there's incredible breadth of expertise present, and Public Health Ideas was really launched to try to align our efforts uh, across departments in the school, but also externally, and that's uh, you know within the university, outside the school, but then also external to the to the university, uh, focusing on a few significant public health issues, with the goal of trying to create deeper impact by working in more coordinated and interdisciplinary ways. Over the last two years, in a phased manner, we've launched four topics under public health ideas. Those are uh, public health ideas for creating healthy and equitable cities, public health ideas for preventing firearm injuries, public health ideas for combating infectious diseases, and then public health ideas for building health equity. So when launching this new seminar series, The Exchange, it was a natural choice to try to align this event with uh, public health ideas themes. And uh, today's event specifically builds on creating healthy and equitable cities theme, uh, which is led by two stellar faculty, uh, Dr. Rashanik Meripana, uh, Associate Professor in Health Behavior and Health Education, and Professor Lu Wang uh, in, in Biostatistics. So thank you, Rashanik and Lu, for your continued leadership in those areas, and you'll hear from them later in today's program. Thank you as well to Malika Belhaj, the program manager for this ideas topic. Uh, I know all of your work behind the scenes is, is really important to moving uh, this work forward. We have an, a fantastic set of events lined up today, and we're in store for a really informative keynote address first and foremost, and what's sure to be a great conversation during our expert panel. Uh, then we have some lightning talks from several faculty at Michigan Public Health. We'll hope, hopefully we'll give you a snapshot of some of the exciting work taking place. And then we'll end with a reception that will also feature uh, as, a, as a showcase some of the work uh, taking place by students and others in the, in the community on this topic. I want to thank all of our presenters. Uh, and other participants for today. And then I want to thank our marketing and communications team for all of the detailed planning to pull uh, this event together. Uh, we know there are lots of logistical details, uh, so I really, really appreciate all of your work and planning. And then I want to thank all of you here in the audience. I know we also have many who are uh, watching online, so thank you all for, for being here. So, and with that, let's uh, go ahead and move uh, directly into the, the, the keynote. I'm thrilled to have Dr. Isabel Angelowski uh, with us to deliver the keynote. Uh, Dr. Angelowski has joined us from Spain, where she's the ICREA professor at the Institute of Environmental Sciences and Technology in the Autonomous University of Barcelona. ICREA is the Catalan Institution for Research and Advanced Studies. 
It works hand in hand with the Catalan universities and research centers to try to integrate uh, ICREA research professors in the Catalan research system. And over the years, these positions have become synonymous with global academic excellence. Dr. Angelovsky is also director of the Barcelona Lab for Urban Environmental Justice and Sustainability. She and her collaborators study how environmental injustice is materialized and contested, and currently her, her work for, focuses in four main areas. Uh, first, the, the politics of the green city as a growing global planning orthodoxy, the social and racial manifestations and impacts of green gentrification for historically marginalized residents, urban planning for health and well-being with a focus on health, equity, and justice, and then justice and inclusivity in climate adaptation planning, including distributional and procedural insecurities uh, produced by adaptation plans, interventions, and then land use configurations and regulations. Uh, so Dr. Anglowski, thank you so much again for joining us, and I'd like to invite you to the podium for your remarks. Oh, yeah, here it is. Here it is. Good afternoon, um, everyone from the Michigan community. It's an honor, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, when Roshanak invited me a few uh, months ago, she was like, I don't know whether you would consider coming. I said, I would love to come here. Uh, my history with public health is very, uh, comes back to a long time ago when I was working as a program manager at the Harvard School of Public Health. They had hired me because Harvard had a wonderful program to uh, support minority students, graduate students, and fund them fully uh, through different careers in biostatistics and in epi and, and, and other specialties in public health. But they didn't have someone to manage the grant. And Louise Ryan, who was an amazing biostatistician, said, OK, you know, OK, we're hiring you. And here I was in a department of biostatistics because the grant was based there, but actually I was doing more like qualitative research, qualitative public health research from a more social science background. And I was there with people talking about parametric, you know, modeling and Bayesian statistics. I was, what, how do you even pronounce that word? And I was like, okay, I don't understand what you do. Let me see what other departments are doing at Harvard and I will go to your lectures. And again, I, was, I, I had a master's in international development from a French university. I learned so much about public health by going through these lectures. And I was like, okay, I'm also gonna do a PhD because that's really inspiring, but I'm gonna go across the river if they take me and do it in planning. So I've always had a big heart and big connection to public health, but my formal training is not in that. So disclaimer today, try to not ask questions about the models I'm talking about <laughs> because that's what grant, amazing grant fundraising and hiring excellent researchers also allows you to do these really multidisciplinary research. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Dean Bowman, for, for trusting that. Um, the research that we do in the lab, uh, in the Boston lab, is, uh, is of relevance to your community, Russian Act, for, for having me, Lou, as well. And um, I'll present a bit of global research that we do in our community, and uh, I look forward to the conversation. So the future of healthy cities, it's a really big question. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be answering it today, but just to give you a little bit of context, uh, about what, what I do and, and how it's anchored in the realities of public health and um, urban planning. So I co-direct a lab called uh, the Lab for Urban Environmental Justice and Sustainability in Barcelona, where we try to look, um, as Dean Bowman was explaining, at different types of interventions that are meant to transform the built um, and the the built environment and the complex dynamics of inequalities in that environment to further social and environmental justice. And most recently, we've done that from the point of view of climate justice, with this general question that mobilizes a lot of our attention, which is you know, this paradox or this contradiction, which is our green cities, which are this growing orthodoxy that you see many cities embarking in, are green cities able to tackle long-standing health 
and new climate injustices, or are we actually reproducing inequalities because of the dynamics of speculation, exclusion, new types of segregation that are embedded in the green city planning? And for now, I'm a little bit more on the negative side, but I am hopeful for a lot of initiatives that I'm seeing here and there. The question is how to bring them up together in a more scaled up um, approach. So first of all, Greening for climate health justice, is that what is at the center of greening? And to give you a little bit of context, what, what we're looking at here is a different type of environmental and climate injustice that cities are confronted with. You have a category of socially vulnerable groups that you can decide who you put into that, that category. And here in our lab, we're looking in particular at the piece on the right, which is the fact that resilient infrastructure, all of the work that cities are building to be more resilient, are actually not taking into consideration the three other components, and there is a risk of displacement that comes through uh, climate intervention. So what we're trying to test, we're trying to measure, identify, and counter these new types of climate injustices that come from uh, investment in resilience planning. And we take into consideration, and that's where history is so important in urban planning and in public health, we try to take into consideration the legacy of urban environmental inequalities that cities are confronted with. And oftentimes we look in particular at green infrastructure access. So Greening 1.0, is a history of investment in an equal greening from you know, the 1920s and 1910. I'm not gonna do your whole history of landscape architecture, don't worry about that. But what we've seen is a division in access to green infrastructure, so parks, playgrounds, gardens, um, by race and class in particular in cities um, around the world, in the United States or in Spain here in, in, in particular size, quality, maintenance, security uh, matter. We also see that in access to tree planting, and that's very important because in the context now of climate change in particular, neighborhoods that are historically the segregated, the red line neighborhood in America, tend to be those with fewer trees, right? So they are least protected um, by, by climate resilient infrastructures, which include trees. And what we're seeing here in Greening 2.0, and that's what we study here, is a little bit the adventures that cities have embarked in, in relationship to urban greening, which is a whole other scale of investment responding to multifunctional needs that cities see that greening can um, cover. And so a whole other vocabulary is being built, a whole other lexicon is being built around urban greenings, which for example include nature-based solutions. Cities are all now about nature-based solutions. And we who try to, as social scientists, deconstruct language a lot, we're like, okay, what is that about? And what you see is that it's a whole other way to market a strategy that actually cities are competing against one another to see who is the greener city, who is the one who is going to be doing these low-cost climate solutions in the most um, effective and scaling up matter. And many of them, and I'm here in a community of public health, though I will bring out a little bit of health data, many city planners, many urban planners are considering, of course, the research that shows that increased exposure to urban greening will help address a variety of uh, negative health outcomes, being increased deaths during summer months, being a poor sleeping pattern, what you want. So there is an increasing evidence from health about the positive impacts of greening and um, on, on health. But what we're trying to deconstruct here is the question of for whom and why. Because it's greening for health in larger, medium-sized cities, I'm not talking about all types of cities, are actually seemingly embedded into speculation, into exclusion that I'm gonna detail a little bit more. And so there is a global mission that's being visualized, that's being projected, that's being marketing, such as the Green Harbor Plan in Boston, which is meant to green 70 square miles of waterfront, and that's also articulated around prizes, around competitions that pitch cities against one another to be among the 10 greenest cities in the world, or if you want to be the greenest city in Europe, that is, for example, the Green Capital Award. So you project yourself into the international scene of investment, of attention, 
with the idea also that you can attract different types of residents, different types of investment, that you can increase the built environment construction, and at the end of the day, the question is this impact is not neutral, which is why we ask for whom in the midterm and long term. This is uh, a big stormwater management project in Barcelona, and literally next door to it, you see this demolition of older time buildings where working class residents are being excluded from living literally in the vicinity of this stormwater management project. So I'm going to dissect it a little bit more now with the main message for uh, today, which is that what we are seeing increasing, increasingly so in mid-sized and large-sized cities is a green paradox. That is that whether or not you believe that greening produces or accelerates gentrification, we believe that it does, increasingly so, at the end of the day, if you live in a gentrifying neighborhood that is at the same time receiving green infrastructure and you have to leave or you are displaced by real estate speculation, by increasing housing costs, by other types of infrastructure that's being built, where do you go as a working class, as a black resident, as a Latino resident? You go to the neighborhoods that are most affordable, which end up being more climate insecure and more gray and more industrial areas. And that's why we call this a dividing access to protective nature through new forms of uh, displacement and segregation. I'll spare you that slide here. Uh, I'm going to go more into the detail, but what I want to say is that there are different pathways that we study to identify how greening is, um, is a way that can also resegregate and produce new inequalities. We have four different markers, or we have four different stakeholders that we take into consideration that play a role in green gentrification. Some of them are private developers and builders because they built green buildings, because they invest themselves in green infrastructure, because they are able to increase the price of housing sales or rents because of the extra value that greening brings them. The elected official also can have a role in green gentrification because of the language, the branding that greening is articulated around in relationship to climate resilience or modernization. Planners and policymakers because of different zoning, for example, or tax break benefits that are being given. And finally, residents themselves. And what we see, you know, quite a few of us are sociologists and geographers, we see that the way in which residents who are gentrifiers, independent of class, have a way of using green space, of, of normalizing accepted behavior of green spaces that will police the behavior of certain groups that will be displaced uh, away from that green space. And I'll go a little bit into detail right now. And as a climate action planner in Boston told us in an interview, so we do a lot of mixed method research, when you think about greening, the place to start is to understand where are the people who are desperate and underserved. Where do they live? Where do they work? Where do they go get food? Where do they buy their clothes? And how are we improving our city? What does that align with where we are putting new sidewalks or improving roads or putting any new stormwater infrastructure? It needs to be measured and then managed and reevaluated on a regular basis. And that's this evaluation work that is key when we try to understand green gentrification trends. That is, is that green infrastructure benefiting residents or are we actually recreating those new landscapes of segregation? So we're in a school of public health. I'm going to talk about measurements, but I won't enter in details of, um, in method. You have access to the papers better than uh, I have almost at this point. But how do we measure green gentrification? What we say in our research is that it is measured through different characteristics that are physical, so demographic change in neighborhoods, accompanied by increase in, in real estate prices, financial, that is the dynamics of um, private appropriation, marketing, neoliberal investments that developers and banks are about or are able to capitalize upon because of greening or thanks to greening. Aesthetical displacement, I won't talk about that today, but that's also a way in terms of which types of parks, which types of aesthetics, architecture, design are being promoted and which one also contribute to displacement. We're doing work on that. And then social and racial dimensions. So these are the cities in which we do a lot of our work, around 30 cities in North America and Europe. Why these ones in particular? They are all mid-sized cities. You can see that some are in different moments of their development pathway, let's put it that way. Some are growing cities, some are more shrinking cities, some are legacy cities. Uh, some are also, you know, 
across different climate zones, across different density or urban form patterns. And the idea there was to compare the role that greening plays in gentrification with a variety of methods and trying to have comparative data and indicators for the quantitative and spatial part, which is the difficult aspect. So physical displacement, this is gonna be the only hypothesis that you see in the entire presentation, so hope you're happy about it. Um, what, how do we measure that? Very simply. What we're trying to do from a quantitative standpoint is to assess the extent to which new green spaces across an entire city over the last 20 years and attributed to a certain time period, so we classify green spaces by decade, are relevant in the presence of other covariates, density, urban form, um, access to transit, real estate development, in explaining gentrification in a subsequent time period. So we really try to understand and parse out the impact of greening. What we see in our studies is that we have three different types of role that greening plays, but in general, in 17 out of the 26 cities in which we did this quantitative analysis, greening plays a relevant role in gentrification. In the categories on the left, you have Detroit, very close. Uh, at the moment, greening plays a subsidiary role. That is, it accelerates gentrification, but there are other characteristics that can also uh, explain why gentrification takes place where it takes place. You have the integrated category cities, which are cities where greening plays a role that is more or less equal to other um, markers of, of change in cities in relationship to gentrification. Boston or Barcelona is there. And then finally, lead green gentrification cities, which tends to be, in the end, the majority of cities. And in the very extensive analysis that we did, we did a lot of Bayesian analysis there, we found that across a variety of development patterns, you actually see cities where greening is the primary driver of these uh, gentrification and associated displacement. And you see in the US, you have places like Milwaukee, very different from a growth and, let's say, attractiveness pattern. Uh, in comparison with Ostend, right? Or Montreal and Vancouver are also quite different, but they're also part of it. So this role, this inequality recreation because of greening is a pattern that is not isolated and is not only present in a particular type, let's say, of cities. Financial displacement, how do we look at that? What we've done a lot uh, are two different types of studies. We've looked at cost of living, in 99 cities in North America and Europe, accounting for other uh, characteristics of cities, and we've compared this, so we've looked for associations with uh, levels of green branding, that is, looking at millions, literally, of documents across these 99 cities, what do we find? And we find that there is a high um, um, statistically significant association between cities that display a high level of green branding and an affordability. Vancouver is probably your poster child of that. One of the greenest cities in the world, if not the top one, and also, at this point, the most expensive city in the world. So what you see here is a limited access to the benefits of urban greening by class and by who are able to afford that. We've also conducted more than 150 interviews in 50 cities with developers, with banks, with real estate um, agents trying to understand what do they do with greening, what role does it place in their investment strategy. And what we find is that developers who are situating their building, who are making decisions next to urban green spaces that they either finance or they benefit from because the city has built them, are able to get lower interest rate or are able to get better lending conditions. So for them, there's a greater return on investment, which anyway, after that, also gets capitalized upon because those developers can market their properties in a uh, higher cost manner or also with a greater negotiation power. So that's the ability of the real estate domain to capture the benefits of greening. And I'll spare you other um, you know, smaller nitty-gritty details here, but what we see is that there's a form of green grabbing, which in our language of, of urban geographers is a form of which you, you grab the rent value, you capture the rent value that building on a parcel that is next to greening is able to afford you as a developer. Then social and cultural and racial forms of displacement. How does that manifest? I'm just sharing a few quotes that we have in our research that shows you how residents who are long-term residents or recently arrived uh, migrants in particular have shared in relationship to what does it mean to live in a green neighborhood that's gentrifying. 
in Montreal, people saying we have a lot more police in the neighborhood that we used to have and do patrols of the park. So it's harder to have a healthy mix of people in our places. In Dublin, there it's very much a class-based uh, analysis. People sharing in a neighborhood called the Liberties how they feel about um, the new parks and green streets in the area. We feel so excluded from it that it's a deep anger. It's a big anxiety and a deep feeling of isolation because again, of the types of then activities and recreational uses that take place that do not represent the residents that live there. And then finally in DC, there's a project that's under, well, I'll talk a little bit about it uh, later on, which is called the 11th Street Bridge Park Project, which is meant to uh, connect together uh, the Anacostia side of the, um, the river with the Navy Yard, very heavily and wide gentrified uh, part of DC, to try to also have a reconciliation and a type of repair, um, let's say, mission associated with it. And yet, what do the residents say? When we are done with the park, most of us won't be here to enjoy it. We will be good enough to serve you Slurpees at the River Festival, but not to live here. So again, who is green space for? Can people afford to live there? Can, it, can people feel welcome there? And so if you really focus on environmental racism, because that's also one of the lenses we look at the most in our research, and that's, let's say, one of the growing uh, works in gentrification studies, really trying to understand the racial characteristics of gentrification, you see really compounded environmental racism, because you see people still exposed to environmental toxics, to a legacy of neglect, of, of vacant lots, but next door to them, you will see a glossy or ritzy greenway or, uh, or what they call resilient park where residents don't feel welcome and they feel too disconnected from. So you have the sense that the use is very exclusive. You also have a sense when you talk to residents about a territorial stigmatization. People still feel that they are looked upon negatively for being the black or the Latino residents living in a particular green neighborhood. There's a sense of economic racism that also gets overlaid into uh, the experiences of residents, especially because of the lack of housing rights, the segregation, the legacy of segregation that remains strong there, and you also see a sense of land loss, so continued land loss, you know, urban renewal, then gentrification, and now green gentrification also as a space to, um, to, use, to lose your land. So this compounded form of environmental racism that greening produce is also a way for us to measure the, um, the social, cultural, and racial exclusion that we see in urban greening. Now, if I move a bit towards climate gentrification and show you a few more specific examples of cities where we've done this work, how does that look like and what does that mean? And a bit of the, um, the hypothesis, so it's more than a hypothesis, it's a, it's a bit of a conceptual analysis of what is climate gentrification. It's the way in which both climate impacts together with the unequal access or the unequal ability to stay in a neighborhood that is being resiliently greened, if you will, or more than that, is also a manifestation of inequalities in climate adaptation and in, um, and in urban redevelopment. So the intersection of exclusive climate protection, maladaptation, and unequal climate security. What we see in the cities where we've done this work, so I'm talking here about, um, in particular, so we've zoomed in in uh, Boston, Philadelphia, Amsterdam, and Barcelona. Why? Because these were the cities in our sample where we saw great climate impacts together with a lot of city action, very progressive city action towards um, adaptation and resilience. And what we see in general, so here is just a few, um, a few specific resident interviews that I'm focusing on is that residents see a very short-term benefit to having climate resilient infrastructure. So there's a sense of reinvestment, but that this investment is very short-lived because in particular, displacement, displacement is not being stopped. So there is not a sense of buying that's very high into urban greening. There is a more of a feeling of a threat. Who is this resilient work for? And in particular, what's interesting, if you go back to the question of, of urban aesthetics, is that while the city is building fancy stormwater management, new green roofs, all of these like greenways, they are also demolishing informal green spaces that residents have farmed, that residents have maintained for years because those are not being you know, well 
maintained, supposedly. They are not manicured enough for the discourse of the green city and for this green orthodoxy. So there is a form of hypocrisy, if you will, in what green spaces get prioritized and which ones get the right to stay for which particular uses. So that's a little bit the qualitative nature of our foundings. But then if you start zooming in into particular um, spatial and quantitative data, what do we see? Take the case of Philadelphia that has invested a lot since the past 20 years in green stormwater management infrastructure. And what we've done in Philly, every uh, dot that you see is the acreage of resilient infrastructure in a particular census tract. So what we've done is mapped over the last 20 years where is green infrastructure going and what's going on from the point of view of gentrification and displacement during those same time periods. So what you see is that the green resilient infrastructure, again, these light blue dots, have been concentrated in terms of public investment from the city in areas that have higher ecological vulnerability. Great for now. But in areas that have very low social vulnerability. And they are also located in areas that, um, and they are also not located in areas that have both high social and high ecological vulnerability, which means that the city is invested in areas that people already have the means if they wanted to adapt on their own, but they are not doing it in areas where residents are climatically exposed and at the same time don't have the means to adapt um, on their own. Continuing, you also see that the areas that have the highest gentrification scores, which are the areas in green, dark green on the map, the census tracts in green and dark green, are the areas that have the highest climate gentrification, uh, climate resilient investment. So there is this spatial juxtaposition between where has gentrification taken place between 2000 and 2016 and where green resilient investment has taken place. So again, this unequal access to climate security. And then looking at the demographic variation, the demographic change in Philly, you can see on the left, in red, the areas where um, black residents have moved the most between 2000 and 2016, so north of Philly in general, and in right where Hispanic residents, so that's the census tracts in orange, have moved. And what you can see is that during that exact time period where residents have moved away from the center of the city and the areas that you see, you know, where the resilient infrastructures have been, they are not going to areas that are protected because all of the climate investment is in the areas that are gentrifying. So that's the way how spatially we can try to understand this relationship between greening and gentrification. Again, who are the benefiters and, and how do we measure it? And again, here as well, the tracks with higher gentrification scores are those with higher um, amount of GRI. Sorry. One step further that we would like to try to build our research, and I'm not showing results today just because it's become very complicated uh, methodologically, so I didn't want to overload you with, with also negative data, because it's really negative at the end of the day, and it's going to bring us down too much. And thinking about green climate gentrification risk, or gentrification risk, that is, here we've traced what has happened in the past. Now we want to try to understand the areas that are most at risk of climate gentrification and for what purposes combined together. And these different, let's say, purposes combined together are those that you see here. We have to understand social risks, meaning where are residents with lower income, renters, um, formerly redlined areas, people over 65, living alone, etc. Then which ones are the areas of our cities that are most at risk of climate impacts, already impacted? Where is the resilient investment going? So it's really trying to understand where already have areas been earmarked for um, investment. How are financial costs evolving? What are the recent trends in, um, in prices and in how people are burdened? So it could also be property taxes or increases in house insurance. That also, can also explain gentrification. And then finally, what is going on in terms of neighborhood change and development? How can we specially locate the areas that are at greater risk of gentrification because they are in reinvestment zones, in opportunity zones, in areas with tax credit? And then we have to bring it all together as researchers to say, you have hot spots of climate gentrification risk there. This is where both climate investment and equity planning should be prioritized. And that's what we try to do work with in different cities where we are involved. So Boston is one of them. Boston is, um, is another one. I'm going to bring it to health briefly because of my audience. Um, 
showing you a bit the work that also with Russia and ACT we've been able to, to, to build together, trying to really bring it back to in the end, why does it all matter? It does matter for health and in my climate planning community, health is still uh, not necessarily an outcome that people measure. So it's also a question of segmentation of people needing to talk together, just also at the level of city planning, right? We need to talk together, having a health environment, housing and economic development, talking together. And so this slide goes back a bit to what I was mentioning in terms of environmental racism. That is that in the um, epidemiology literature, you see an ep epidemiological risk transition, which we see in relationship to gentrification and health as well. That is that residents are not only exposed to a legacy of toxics and vacant land and industrial uh, impacts, they also have climate impacts to deal with, they have disinvestment, or unequal reinvestment to deal with, and they also have greening as a way to measure uh, inequalities and impacts on their health. And that's what my colleague Helen Cole have, has been publishing on over the last few years and measured in the cities where, where we've done some work that is this combination, these compounded health impacts on people's lives. And going back a bit to gentrification, you've probably heard that in other talks here in the school, but you see a variety of impacts between gentrification and health that can range from chronic anxiety, risks of suicide, especially among youth, increasing. You have the issues of mental health, more generally speaking, depression rates um, increasing, sleep deprivation. And sleep deprivation can be about many things. It can be because all of a sudden your neighborhood becomes full of trucks, full of real estate construction. You have gentrifiers that have a very different lifestyle. And in East Boston, where I do a lot of, of my work, people are saying, yes, at night now you have drug dealers taking place because young people are moving in. They take cocaine. And so the dealers are coming in. There are fights between dealers. So you think gentrification is addressing the relationship between um, unequal environments and, and crime risk. It actually does not, because these gentrifiers have very different lifestyles and consumption patterns, which include drugs, and so they're bringing in the dealers in the neighborhood. So gentrification does not improve uh, crime. So that's just um, a side story from actually the police officer that is just living next to green gentrification areas in Boston. He's been saying, you know, we now as police officers are trying to fight different crimes at the same time. And we thought the neighborhood was in the right direction. And there were these gentrifiers also bringing in new risks and safety issues in the neighborhood. Anyway, calming down because I get really mad when I talk about that. <laughs> so yeah, so mental health and physical um, health inequities in the middle also of uh, green gentrification, which we see, so we've tried to then disentangle in which types of cities do we see this relationship more, more prevalent. And when you see the cities on the right, where you see this relationship, the negative relationship between gentrification and health, it especially has to do with threats to housing and financial security, social cultural displacement, loss of services and amenities in these types of neighborhoods. Schools tend to close because more you know, younger residents without families come in, the demographics change, schools are losing budget, so loss of, serv loss of services, loss of investment in uh, youth recreational centers because again, the population people have to move away. And then finally also, the socially unwanted behavior, I'm saying in a very mild way, and increased crime that uh, gentrification and this relationship between greening and gentrification produces. This paper, if you want to have a look at it, I think is quite complete to look qualitatively, but with a pretty large sample at this variation and this combination of impacts on people's health. So at the end of the day, what do you see? You see disruptive green landscapes in comparison with therapeutic landscape. And I'm going back here to the literature on gentrification, I'm sorry, on greening and health, which tends to be very positive. If you look at the environmental epi literature, it's very positive. Greening has all of these positive impacts on health. I mentioned that at the beginning. And yet here what we find is that these therapeutic benefits are actually very disruptive in the lives of residents. And that brings us to a false choice, right? To either be what I call a gentry anxiety resident, someone who lives as a chronic way, as a permanent way with gentrification anxiety or a gentrification exile. I'm out of here because I can't live here anymore. And that's the false choice that we're also trying to fight through. So in the next seven, eight minutes, I want to bring you a bit to more positive outlook and what also um, what we try to do in our research, which is trying to identify from a policy 
planning and community standpoint, a lot of interesting initiatives that uh, can bring us to greater climate health justice. This report is one that we published a year and a half ago uh, called Policy and Planning Tools for Urban Green Justice, where we look at 50 cities in North America and Europe and the variety of both anti-displacement and equitable greening that needs to take place together. And I'm insisting on these two poles because that's really what we see needs to happen. You need to have both, um, sorry, you need to have both anti-displacement measures, which have to do with, character, with traditional measures, as well as a way to do greening that will privilege also deep inclusivity and, um, and engagement. So anti-displacement tools can be very diverse. What we see in some cities are community land trust. We see uh, tax incremental financing to try to capture the land value increases of different green projects and reinvest them into uh, services, into affordable housing. We see inclusionary zoning um, measures being passed, but not at 10% or 15% of all uh, housing that needs to be uh, affordable, but maybe at 50%. That's what some of the cities are engaged in. And then we also see these improved and open green amenities that can be financed through green bonds or through things that will, through mechanisms, fiscal mechanisms in particular, then can guarantee green uh, budgets for cities because other places maybe not in America, but in London you see a lot of um, cuts in the budget of urban greening departments. Just a few examples. So in Nantes, what the city has done is to go for an equality approach, meaning that rather than only targeting areas that are socially vulnerable and need greening, we're going to need to green the entire city to avoid creating these pockets of attraction just for a few. So they've increased green space by 200%. Every resident lives within 300 meter of a green area. And then the city council has managed to pass inclusionary zoning at 56%. I know it's very unrealistic for now in America, but there are some places where understanding the politics of how that takes place also quite, you know, can give us some lessons about how to make it happen. That's how not. Uh, looks like now that the type of affordable housing that's, that's being built, and for many of these projects that are eco-districts, residents also have access to, uh, to a community garden or to a private allotment. So you combine food justice and um, environmental justice together. What we also see from the point of view of organizing, and I don't want to minimize the role of, of civic organizing, is that you have, in types of successful situations, multi-expertise and multi-sectoral coalitions coming together. Youth groups, with environmental groups, with community development corporations, with environmental justice, you know, pro-transit, pro-cleaning uh, vacant space activists. And they build this expertise that then bring residents to city council meetings, to zoning meetings, fundraise around different types of projects that will also produce greater green justice. And some of them, have a particularly important decolonial and emancipatory greening lens to them. And I'm talking here about racialized communities with very deep legacy of segregation and environmental racism, where greening can serve as a tool to bring different types of land arrangements together that will empower also the wealth of, um, of black, of Latino, and other communities. That's the case of Portland, Oregon, that has uh, a neighborhood that's called Cully, has an eco-district where residents have fundraised with community development corporations to change empty buildings, vacant lots, and make them affordable housing units together with green roofs on top of them and with resilient infrastructure around them that's being designed, maintained, and used by uh, different Latino groups who live um, in the neighborhood. That's one of the projects that they have, the Thomas Cully Park that they managed to get done in 2018. Then you, you have this project in uh, DC, which is called the 11th Street Bridge Park project that I was mentioning, where equity is meant to be designed in a way that's intentional for every decision around the park together with reparative. And what's key here is that those renderings that you see, the park is not there yet. So what they are doing is that before they even create the park, they work around affordable housing, community land trust, workforce development, youth training, political organizing, to avoid that once that park gets built and all of the waterfront, as people love to say, activated, before that activation comes from, there are protections, especially land protections um, 
in place. In Boston, there is a new community um, land trust that's being enacted in Chelsea, which is a, a very heavily Latinx community where the fundraising has been focused on buildings with green roofs on them. So there it's a combination of different types of financial arrangements where you have affordability combine, combined with uh, resilience and we as universities have been able to support with seed grants. So that's also changing the role of universities, right? Not only as only, let's say, community action research, but also directly as funders of community uh, organizing especially around Triple H heat housing um, and health at some of the workshops that we've worked with to try to define, um, help define priorities in the community. Boston also has what's called the Talbot Norfolk Triangle Eco Innovation District around, again, bringing together TOD, transit oriented development, greening and affordability around it. I'm just gonna finish for a few seconds uh, talking about Barcelona where I think a lot of interesting work has been taking place, but there is a lot of question, which is, is there transformative climate planning that goes beyond the change in infrastructure? Because our model of city planning, I will say, is quite transformative. Does that account for equity? So where are we at? And I'll, I'll go quite quickly on that. As you might have heard, Barcelona in 2016 created a super block model, which is transit pacifying entire blocks of cities three by three, and, and making them fully pedestrian and having different types of green spaces at the intersection of streets. So the current model or the previous model was the one on the left and the super blocks model are the one on the right. And what's powerful about it is that it definitely says the car is not the enemy, even though that's what the car lobby says, it is the health of residents need to be prioritized. It's one of the most heavily air polluted city in Europe. So the city has really transformed its rhetoric because it knows that the car lobby is way too powerful to deal with, um, you know, to, to deal with. So they need to go in a different way. And the idea has been focusing on well-being, green city, and also a feminist city. So they've gone around ethics of care, ethics of care in transformative planning, trying to think about a city that's not just productive, but that can respond to uh, different types of, of residents' needs, and especially needs through the day. Focusing on women, kids, and the elderly in a particular. We had a fantastic mayor that got ousted, Ada Colau, in May. That's a tragedy for all of us. But anyway, we'll resist um, in the future. The, the next mayor is, is not that bad. But all of this to say that it's thinking about the city from the point of view of care rather than from the point of view of, of cars. And what's interesting here to think about is also the question of mobility equity. That is, we talk a lot about transit equity, transit justice, bikes, public transit. But here we also try to think in Barcelona about a different scale. That is, how can residents who need to have 15 minute city neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are mixed use and compact, who are the residents that will be targeted here? Here we talk in particular about the elderly and about kids. But then, what about the need of mobility for working class residents and central workers who necessarily in the city of Barcelona and other places will end up having to commute long distances. How can their mobility also be accounted for? And this model of the super blocks has not been enough so far to account for their uh, mobility needs. And so what the city has done lately, and that's a, plan, that's a map from a year ago, is that it has wanted to do this green access, saying if we are able to green entire districts and connect greening together and have bus lines that are aligned with greater distance routes of residents, we'll be able to address proximity needs as well as long distance needs of residents. And there was also the question of trying to avoid what they call ghettos of green privilege. That was the, the word in Spanish that I'm directly translating, because the pushback in the city was, you are, green gentrification, you are green gentrifying the city by having these super blocks, by three by three blocks in the city, and you are going to create these islands of green privilege. And so now the idea is to try to have a much more linear redistribution of green benefits as well as dealing with mobility justice. We'll see where that goes, but I just wanted to, um, to finish by, by this. So just to conclude, Green spaces are vital for urban health. That's a disclaimer I want to keep because I end up always first question. So you don't like green spaces. And I said, that's not what I want to say. But we need to go beyond uh, the trickle down effect 
that a lot of the literature, a lot of the planners and policymakers seem to see associated with urban greening and go beyond the green city orthodoxy. And in particular, and I will finish with that, in racial context, greening must not overlook a deep legacy of toxics, of segregation and exclusionary racial land use practices and their ongoing manifestations that remain today. It will need to think about reparations, land controls, and different types of arrangements that can create a more emancipatory greening. So, stop there. Thank you. So, at this time, we do have uh, a few minutes for questions. So, uh, we'll ask you to be seated here and we can take some questions. That's a very important question in relationship to how do you really parse out what is greening, what is not. We had five categories of green spaces. We had parks, gardens, community gardens, urban forests, and uh, recreational spaces so, such as sports yards and, and, and other kind of public green amenities for recreation and sports. So what we did was to, to geolocate and, oh sorry, what we did was to uh, geolocate and aggregate all of these green spaces um, in different maps through time, starting in 1990 and looking at where they were growing over time. So imagine we had like in the end, hundreds of thousands of green spaces geolocated, dated per, per, per city. And what we did was to, so that was our independent variable, we also had them categorized, but I didn't present a paper that looks at different category of green space and gentrification. Anyway, we had them also uh, you know, disaggregated by types of green spaces. And then our outcome variable was gentrification as an index where we looked at um, social indicators of gentrification. For example, how the changes in working class residents or in the occupations of residents change over time. And then the index also included rental uh, prices. And so once we had those two you know, independent and outcome variables, we also added mediating uh, variables, which were as distance to the city center, crime rates, um, as well as real estate development and um, population growth over the same, you know, I mean, basically at different points in time, and through this Bayesian statistics model that we, we, we put together, that's not the right uh, verb, I'm sorry, I'm tired. Um, through, through, through different types of, of Bayesian models, we were able to say whether greening had a city-wide impact on gentrification. So we didn't do a green space, and around the green space do we see gentrification? No, we try to do it at the whole city-wide level, which is actually a much more difficult relationship to parse out because, first of all, it's not just one indicator of gentrification that has to change. It's not just increasing property prices. It's looking at these other uh, variables that form part of the index, and then it's looking at the whole citywide relationship. Is that precise enough? Probably not enough, but. <laughs> Are there other questions? Yes.
have a microphone oh, coming. Yeah. Yeah, so here. with this being a cumulative index, is there like equal weight given to all of the things you mentioned? Or is there more weight given, for example, for the social indicators versus uh, the rent or other stuff that can be like um, helped through policy changes? Yes. Yeah. So there is an index um, in ecology that tries to um, bring the diversity of different characteristics of an ecosystem, for example, uh, into consideration to, to determine whether that ecosystem is diverse. And so we used the base of that index, which is called the Shannon Index in Ecology, and adapted it to, uh, to social urban systems. And so what was all together was the social, where the social indicators, so um, you know, all of the demographic variables, if you will, and then outside that index or outside that Shannon Index was rent, because, you know, the measure was different. It was not residents, it was prices. And then we brought it all together to, um, to have the gentrification score that was this consideration of both what was in the Shannon Index, if you want to call it that way, of social change, and outside that, the property, uh, the rental price change. Other questions? Paul. Yeah, thank you for your talk. You briefly mentioned um, the potential role universities can play, in particular funding some mm -hmm. of um, the work within communities. I'm wondering if you could just say a little more about what, um, what you think is possible and, and what you recommend for universities' role. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's possible? So interestingly enough, the, um, there were two grants here that uh, form part of the um, of the research that I described. One, which was a large, I would say probably the equivalent of of an NSF grant here, which funded the social, the um, quantitative and the qualitative analysis together with a documentary that, for us, we use as an online interactive documentary to amplify and document the ongoing struggles, the civic activism struggles of these areas. So we had six cities in our documentary together, or for which we had three uh, representatives of the neighborhood where green gentrification was the most manifest. So this documentary, I didn't show it today, but is interactive in the sense that you can navigate as a reader across these different videos, try to understand what type of green justice or green injustice is manifested there and compare what's going on between cities. So we have Barcelona, Nantes, Boston, Portland, Washington, and Montreal. So cities where also the types of affordable housing structure, for, you know, for example, is different. And so that was one of the tools we managed to fit in as a more, let's say, progressive way of doing uh, research in addition to doing very kind of you know, research that then we fed back into um, to the policy world with different types of uh, workshops and convening. We had the fed into, it doesn't sound very good, but where we really worked well together with a few cities. So we had cities with which we built partnerships. Boston was one, Philadelphia was one, uh, DC was one, and then Barcelona was one. And then there was the work with community groups to we did a lot of work with the media, the documentary also, all of the videos are individually available for them to use as part of their campaigns. So that was the support to activism through traditional research, which was not very big. But then there was another grant that was a complementary grant to this large grant that I was able to apply to, which is an action grant. And that grant allows you to give seed funding two groups with which you had done research before. So thankfully, the more traditional research um, grant gives you the credential, if you will, to be able to say, OK, now I can do something a bit more funky and creative. It's not necessarily research. It's not going to be extractive research by any stretch of the imagination. It's really trying to empower groups on the ground. So we went back to the neighborhoods where we had done the research, including, for example, East Boston, and we said, OK, now, where is your activism around green and climate justice? What do you need funding for? And they said, well, we need funding for this community land trust because we want to build a green roof on several of the buildings that we are going to build around the green, um, around the community land trust, but we don't know how to do that. And we want to partner with an environmental justice group in another little city called Everett, and these people know how to do it. And then these people across the river, they don't have a community land trust, but they want to have one. So there is this exchange of skills and expertise that this type of grant allows them to do with these different seed grants. So that's just an example. 
So I'd like to ask a question. Uh, so first of all, thank you for just a, an extremely uh, powerful and compelling uh, talk that you provided. And it, it's one that as I think about many of the factors that you touch on, uh, the, the benefits of greening, uh, the trends that you see, uh, some of the pitfalls in, in those trends are, are made very, very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, often what we see is that um, activity is driven by economic or financial mm -hmm. considerations, uh, political uh, considerations with uh, sometimes tilted toward constituencies with influence. And so if, if um, I'm wondering how you would frame sort of the case for change, not just being the right thing to do, the beneficial thing to do to protect uh, health and, and, and other considerations, but maybe in terms of economic uh, drivers or political drivers or, or, or other uh, sort of uh, kind of other ways to strengthen the already compelling case. That's the two pivotal points that community groups will say are the most difficult. Putting a green roof together, the financing of it, it's a core physical infrastructure that can be financed thanks to foundations, thanks to private uh, investments. But how do you get new programs of workforce development, small businesses for possibly displaced residents really off the ground? How do you finance that? And that's always what EJ environmental justice groups tend to say. The environment seems the most difficult, but actually it's not. It's really the economics of it because you have to balance. For example, if you have a community land trust, not everyone is in favor of a community land trust because in areas where intergenerational wealth gaps and intra uh, you know, in, intercity wealth gaps are so huge. People need the wealth to be built to send their kids to college. That's the case of Anacostia, which has an area median income that is 60% less than the rest of the city. So we say, great, I'm going to have a community land trust, but then my house is not going to, um, the, if my house isn't within the trust, it's not going to appreciate as much as the cost of my neighboring um, of my neighbor who is not within the trust, and by the way, who happens to be white. So his house or their house is gonna be higher up anyway because the house of white residents tend to be higher appreciated than the one of black. So all of this to say that how can you avoid community land trust um, from actually deepening these interracial wealth gaps when there is a need in, especially I say that from someone who holds a US passport but doesn't live here, where the needs of people of, for healthcare, basic needs for healthcare and education are so drastic, especially if you want this social mobility and you can't finance them necessarily with a community land trust. So how you to balance this? This is really hard. I don't have a very good answer for that. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, we have time for one more question if there is one. All right, with that, let's uh, give a round of applause for our... Uh, Thank you.